We partnered with the Charlotte Motor Speedway and we got from the Coca-Cola 600 all of their bottles and cans. So they backed in this big dumpster. So Daniel opened the door and like all of the cans just come tumbling out and we had to process all of that. And that was in that moment of, oh, how long is it gonna take? But it's treasure because we sold it all. Turning trash into treasure, it's all happening at the Innovation Barn. And though the doors just opened last year, they've been building a circular economy in Charlotte, North Carolina for over a decade. Duke Energy, our downtown association, and the city of Charlotte actually came together. They wanted a sustainability initiative focusing on Charlotte. We took 61 of the 64 largest buildings in downtown Charlotte. We put shadow meters in all of those buildings with giant kiosks in the lobby. So they could figure out how to reduce their energy use. We saw a 19.2% reduction over five years, which was $26 million in savings to the buildings. Not only do they save mega dollars, they also cut CO2 emissions by 300,000 tons. That's like taking 11,000 cars off the road. Because we used all this technology, we used the data to drive efficiencies in our downtown, we were then dubbed a very smart city and we're like, why, yes, we are. And so now we get calls from so many other cities, New York City, Chicago, Boulder, to Cleveland, Ohio, who call us to see what we're doing here. Envision Charlotte is doing a lot. You could almost say they're obsessed with making waste a thing of the past and making sure what we have stays useful. And we learned about the circular economy. The easiest way to describe it is like a forest. There's zero waste in a forest. So a tree grows, it dies, it rots, it renutrients the ground. Everything works symbiotically. We are a linear society. So we buy something, we use it, and we throw it in the landfill. So we need to use our resources better. We need to design better. We need to design out waste. What we have that's going to landfill, we need to divert that and keep upcycling or reusing it or recycling. How can I take a waste product and do something that's environmentally better by taking a product that would decay and off-gas all its carbon and instead we'll use it and store that carbon locally. In circular economy and keeping those materials in a full cycle, instead of it just going to the landfill, which is 100% wasteful, we can tap into multiple streams. Looking at solutions to divert from the landfill. Hence, the innovation barn. Even their location is an example of closing the loop. The lore is this used to house animals for the police department or maybe oxen that picked up trash. And now, an old abandoned barn has been given a new life. We're the first city in the U.S. to have an innovation center focused on the circular economy. We really want to affect the way people recycle because there's such high contamination rates, so it ends up going to landfill. Part of the problem is that little recycling symbol doesn't mean anything. Every municipality recycles differently. You may recycle glass here, but if you go up the road, they don't recycle. So you move up the road or you cross a line and now you're putting glass and you're contaminating because you don't know what your municipality is recycling. If there was some kind of baseline that everyone knew that you could absolutely recycle these six things and just these six, we would probably do a lot better on recycling. I think there needs to be a radical change with recycling and I think we're gonna see it. We've got some ideas, maybe. You want to shred some plastic? Take some of this. We got to turn the uh, beast on. All right. Really hard. There we go. That's crazy. It's snowy. It's snowy. That's magical. California just passed a law that by 2030, you have to have 50% of your PET has to be recycled content. PET, a thermoplastic polymer, also known as polyester, used in pretty much every plastic bottle at the grocery store or gas station. So it is putting a lot of pressure on those companies to do better on recycling, to do better on how they get those bottles and cans back. We have tons of different partnerships with different companies and corporations, but also venues, and we take their plastics, PET specifically, and we make sure that it gets made back into bottles and not downgraded into things like polyester. During the pandemic, everyone started using takeout plastic containers, and then we have four tons of it. That's how much 
people have brought to us. Daniel, who works with me, had this brilliant idea that we could take those takeout plastic containers and shred them and turn it into filament that you could make PPE. All cities are having a problem with glass because it is extremely heavy to ship it to the recycling places and because it breaks, it's dangerous for workers. Innovation Barn found a solution in a glass crusher. So we crushed a bunch of wine bottles. There seemed to be a lot after COVID that were uh, donated to us, all from my house. But we crushed them and so we have all these different sizes of sand. So we're doing an experiment right now to see if we can use it as an aggregate in concrete and then we could actually create a whole business and jobs. Speaking of businesses and jobs, that's what Innovation Bar and entrepreneurs are hard at work creating. My passion is dirt and playing in dirt and uh, trying to build this company up. Seven or eight years ago, I got a call from our other partner, Chris, and he said, hey, you know, for this idea for a business, people want to compost. They don't have time, space, or patience to do it at home, and we should do it for them. It's kind of just an easy way for them to do the right thing without having to get their hands dirty. And so they launched Crown Town Compost. When it was just David and I, we would be out there at 5 a.m., both on bikes, picking up buckets. It started with 15 or 20 accounts. We bought a truck and we bought another truck and now we have employees and we're servicing over a thousand homes in Charlotte. Our core is getting food waste from households and businesses out of the trash so we don't let it go to the trash in the first place. We collect it, we make it easy for them. That goes on to our farm facility. It's sorted, we have different feedstocks there, wood chips, manure. It's blended, screened, and then we offer it back to our customers twice a year. And since the pandemic inspired a wave of home gardening, they've started a sustainable landscaping business. In the South, the number one crop in a city is lawns, and we're trying to eliminate as many of those lawns as possible and grow food with it. A food forest, essentially. A food forest is kind of a, a perennial system of growing a variety of food in a low maintenance sort of style. So you have trees, you have berry bushes, you have perennial vegetables. It doesn't need to be giant. I mean, it could be, we just installed one yesterday and it's on a 10th of an acre. But we put in four fruit trees and we put in over 30 different perennial food options. If all your neighbors do it, now you've got kind of a highway of food forest and it's bringing pollinators back into the city. They're all composting. So that food waste that they're generating from their backyard farm is being collected, fed, to the black soldier fly, fed to the fish, and that compost is going right back to their backyards. Wait, black soldier flies? Soldier fly composting, that's a new trend right now. Our role specifically here at the Innovation Barn is to pilot a black soldier fly composting operation. Their larval stage eats a bunch of food waste. Multiple times their body weight in food waste and they grow really quickly. They've got a lot of protein and, and fat, the things that chicken and fish need to grow, and they eat stuff really fast. So probably about an inch beneath the surface of uh, this food waste mixed with wood shavings in here are uh, 10,000 black soldier fly larvae. What? Yeah, so this is actually in the composting process right now. It's like noticeably warmer. I feel it. Part of the warmth is the food waste and microorganisms digesting it, but it's also the black soldier flies digesting it. That's incredible. I mean, it's really, really cool. I, I it is disgusting, but really amazing. Why bother with bugs when traditional composting already works? Black soldier flies are like tiny little garbage disposals. They eat our food scraps, and as they grow, they become ideal food for fish and chicken. So the cycle continues. The value of larvae versus the value of soil is kind of higher when looking at economic impact and, and job production. People think that kind of trash in general goes away, right? People think that food in the landfill also decomposes, but the fact is that it doesn't, at least not in the same way. Organics is one of the biggest issues for landfills. It comprises most of the waste that goes in there, and because it doesn't get air, it, it off-gasses methane, which is the worst. Methane's you know, 20 to 30 times more powerful of a greenhouse gas than CO2. People might feel like they don't waste that much food just by trying compost or just keeping your food waste out of the trash can for a week for just a normal household. Our average customer is generating like 10 pounds of food waste a week. Once you've kind of seen it, you can't go back to just tossing all that stuff in the trash can. Now that we're thinking twice about throwing away food, what about all the trees we throw away? 
The metropolitan area of Charlotte, which is about a million residents, we are probably at about 400 to 500,000 pounds a day. Officially in North Carolina, they don't go to a landfill. They do go to a stump dump, which most of us would call the same thing. I met a gentleman here, he owned a tree service, and he told me about this problem, that they spend, I think, 100,000 a year at the dump, just one company. So I, I said, well, geez, I wonder if I could take what I know and make a business out of it. So Damon Barron built Carolina Urban Lumber to keep waste logs out of the landfill and turn them into everything from big slabs of lumber to custom furniture. So far, they've kept 4,702,000 pounds of wood from ending up in a landfill. We partner with probably 10 major tree services. They have cranes and trucks that pick up big logs. Their waste product at the end of the day is our commodity. In my past life, I sold material lumber. I met a man who was building a casket from a tree that he planted when he was five. I had a two hour drive home. I asked myself, what have I planted? A cherry tree often is felled in North America and Pennsylvania primarily. The cherry tree is cut into veneers. The veneers are shipped overseas. The veneers are made into furniture because of low production cost, and then the furniture is shipped back. It was measured that the average cherry veneer traveled 25,000 miles. And we give people options to get furniture and lumber that didn't travel more than 10 miles in its entire life. We work hard at it at all facets. We're not just woodworkers. We're not just running a sawmill. In my mind, there's no reason why a sustainable, eco-conscious business can't be profitable. It's our business, and we have to stick to it. Until there's no more waste logs, we're gonna do what we do. There is a circular nature to this, and what we started with is only the, the back end. So taking waste trees and doing something with them is great. I love it, and uh, it's, it's provided for us. But figuring out the front end is, is the critical part. The reason we have waste logs is because we didn't plant the thing that could be used well in the beginning. The living usefulness of a tree is as important to the potential material usefulness of a tree in an urban center. You have to plant things that when they're dead, they can be used as opposed to thrown away. So Carolina Urban Lumber is starting a volunteer tree program to help native trees grow. Because the best tree to grow in the community is one that volunteered naturally in the community from that soil, from that region, from that air, from that density of carbon. People are always looking for a way that they can do better themselves and what they can do to help reduce climate change. And so one way is looking at the circular economy. We're passionate about, first and foremost, taking care of the planet, taking care of the planet for others who are both living and thriving now and who will be in the future. I think sustainability becomes a lot about those who will come after us. It goes back to my kid. You know, like, what is the world that he's going to grow up in? And when you look at a lot of traditional landscape and traditional waste models, it's, it's unbelievably unsustainable. It's got to be a new way of living. We've, we've got to treat our earth better. We need to reduce CO2. We have got to stop climate change. So there's a holistic approach for cities like Charlotte and individuals that want to make a difference. I think this is an easy one to look at. Reduce what's coming into your house, reduce your waste, keep things from going to landfill. We have to protect our resources better. And the way that I think we can really make a bigger difference is giving individuals something they actually tangibly can do. What we do matters. Each job matters a lot. It matters in the final outcome. It matters in the bigger scheme of humanity. It does matter. 